little while ago, Aaron Rauch published an article on Zam using the role of random chance and Hearthstone as a lens to discuss the game's design sensibilities and social implications. There's a link in the description. It's an interesting piece and I encourage you to go read it, but while I can appreciate the larger points it makes about the game, I ended up taking issue with its basic premise of approaching Hearthstone as an unknowable series of dice rolls that players have no real agency over. Today I'd like to expand on the concept of skillful play in Hearthstone, not because I want to prove Aaron wrong, but because reading his thoughts made me realize how much my own perspective on the game has changed over the last year. To be clear, despite my misgivings, luck certainly plays a big role in Hearthstone and I'm not here to pretend that my uber lead strats are going to help you win 110% of all your games. The randomized nature of your draw is a significant factor in all card games, digital or physical, and Hearthstone doubles down on that fact by including a variety of card effects, such as summoning random minions, that would be awkward to resolve through conventional means such as dice rolls or coin tosses. Yogg-Saron, a card that casts random spells at random targets, is one of the most frequently cited examples of the game's reliance on random chance. Search YouTube and you'll find hundreds of thousands of videos of the card failing to do anything, or single-handedly winning the player who used it the game. And that's kind of the problem here. The discourse around random chance in Hearthstone centers on flashy cards like Yogg-Saron or Evolve not because they dominate the game and drastically change the outcome of every match they are in, but because they have the potential to create these kinds of memorable moments. Positive and negative outliers are more likely to stick in mind and be shared on social media than the average results of playing these cards. It would be easy to pin this problem on internet culture with its short attention span and disregard for context and nuance, but to a certain degree, the game created this problem itself. As part of its effort to make rare cards appealing and sell more packs, Hearthstone gives legendary cards such as Yogg's Saron special visual effects, animations and musical stingers, a digital value proposition that contributes to the warped impression that these cards are more impactful than they really are. There are many powerful cards in the game to be sure, but it's important to consider their effectiveness in context. Yogg-Saron, for instance, is a late game card that can only be played 10 or more turns into a particular match. Many Hearthstone matches conclude before ever getting to that point, and even if a game isn't technically over at this stage, it may be all but decided. If an aggressive deck has you on the ropes and you need a miracle to get back in the game, Yogg-Saron gives you a small chance of success, but it's nowhere near as effective as a cheaper card that could have turned the tides earlier. Meanwhile, if you make it to turn 10 against an aggressive deck and you don't need a miracle save, you're already in a winning position and the less flashy late game card may give you a better chance of securing victory than one that potentially does nothing. And if you play Yogg-Saron against other late game decks, even a very very good result may not be enough to deal with the powerful cards your opponent brings to the table. So not only are the odds of successfully turning around the game with Yogg-Saron pretty low, the odds of even ending up in a game that is so closely matched that it comes down to Yogg's around coin toss are even lower. The number of games in which this card is going to be the deciding factor between victory and defeat are a tiny fraction of a tiny fraction of all matches you play. So while it represents one of the most prominent examples of random chance in the game, it's also something of a fringe case. In order to give a more well-rounded assessment of the role of random chance in Hearthstone, we need to discuss the basic moment-to-moment -moment interactions and decisions in the game, not the highlight real YouTube montage plays. In other words, we need to talk about basic concepts such as trading and board control. Let's begin by examining what sets Hearthstone apart from similar games. In card games such as Magic the Gathering, one player decides which of their creatures are going to attack and the other player decides which of their creatures, if any, will be used to block them. This gives defending players a lot of options. Small creatures can be used to stall larger ones and any creatures you want to keep on the board for their special effects can be kept out of harm's way. In Hearthstone, however, any minion on the board can directly attack any enemy minion, with some exceptions. This approach is likely informed by the need to simplify complex turn structures and combat phases in order to bring the game to larger audiences and mobile platforms. Tapping minions and dragging them to their target is a much more satisfying basic interaction than declaring attackers and waiting to see what happens. However, as a result of this design choice, Hearthstone also fundamentally empowers players when they are on the offensive. The ability to attack and destroy your opponent's minions with your own, an act generally known as trading, allows players to force their opponents into a purely reactive position if they ever get ahead. Minions generally can't do anything the turn they are played, so once a player loses all of their minions, they are often stuck playing new ones only to have them destroyed before they even get to use them. If your opponent has the board, they have all the options. Big minions can destroy small ones and survive, groups of small minions can team up to take out big ones. It's impossible to discuss trading and board control in isolation. Trading minions effectively allows you to take control of the board, and controlling the board allows you to take beneficial trades. 
Together, these concepts form one of the most fundamental principles for succeeding in Hearthstone. The ability to snowball games out of control by securing the board is part of the reason why spells that can clear the board and bring the game back to a neutral state are so impactful, but the necessity only shows how powerful board control is in the first place and, of course, players might not always draw these spells in time to prevent disaster. So what does all of this have to do with random chance? Well, the importance of effective trading makes it essential to look at the game first and foremost in terms of the basic attack and health values of minions, and that perspective reduces the vast number of possible random outcomes in the game to a much smaller set of meaningful distinctions. From the point of view of trading and stat lines, the number of possible results when playing cards with random effects is much smaller than you might think. For instance, the card Maelstrom Portal summons a random one-cost minion when played, of which there are currently 65. That number makes it sound as if there was a wide range of possible results, but in reality there are only three basic types of one-cost minions. There are two ones, there are one ones, and there are one twos. Under ideal circumstances, two ones are the best choice because they can trade upwards into two mana three twos, and your opponent is likely to play a three two because he can trade into a four three, which trades into five fours, six fives, and so on. A chain of escalation that can be broken by playing minions with higher defensive stats. 1-1s one -one generally compensate for their low stats with stronger active effects such as adding another card to your hand and they can still trade into 2-1s evenly. 1-2s likewise trade evenly into 2-1s but they shine against 1-1s. One so on the surface, Hearthstone offers a wide variety of choices when it comes to which minion to play on your first turn, but in practice the choice boils down to this rock-paper-scissors triangle. There are some exceptions to this rule of course such as 1-mana one 1-3s one or 2-2s, two but these outliers are still defined by where they fit into the flowchart of effective trades. This is not to say that this perspective turns Hearthstone into a solvable puzzle, but that the focus on stats and trading offers a point of reference that allows you to weigh your options against each other, both in terms of which card to play on a specific turn and which cards to even put in your deck. By interpreting every card as defined by its relationship to other cards, you can begin to read the game more systematically. It starts with the basics of successful trading, which leads into the nuances of class matchups and specific cards to look out for, and then, finally, an understanding of which decks are currently being played and how to beat them. When you lay out the fundamentals of playing Hearthstone successfully like this, it may all sound pretty obvious. Try to destroy the enemy's minions without losing your own. But the curious thing is how little the game actually does to communicate these basic tenets to its players. Hearthstone dedicates a lot of time to the issue of how to play, but very little to that of how to play it successfully. During its tutorial, players are often locked into a single predetermined move for the sake of demonstration, and while you can argue that this degree of linearity is necessary in order to establish the rules of the game, it also means that players are never really taught how to think about different possible moves, or what sort of questions they should be asking themselves while weighing alternatives. The game's lack of explanation for these finer details has led to the creation of a cottage industry of online guides and YouTube pros, a situation that is mirrored in practically every competitive multiplayer game in existence. This leaves us with an interesting dilemma. On the one hand, games are under no obligation to explain and tutorialize every aspect of themselves. Even if such a level of candor were feasible, we would lose the sense of mystery and discovery that goes along with a certain degree of uncertainty. On the other hand, a game the size of Hearthstone, which now claims to have over 70 million players, cannot be judged merely as a collection of rules and systems. It has become its own social space, and what the game communicates to those 70 million players also lays the foundation for how they interact with each other. Not every player consumes the kind of outside content that explains the finer points of Hearthstone, and the fact that the game itself offers very little guidance in terms of how to improve or what you're even doing wrong affects the experience of not just individual players, but also everyone around them. A little while ago, I was playing Arena, Hearthstone's draft format, in which you repeatedly choose one of three random cards in order to fill your entire deck. On that day, I was mainly offered early game cards, so I proceeded to build a very aggressive deck that flooded the board with cheap minions. One of my opponents punished this strategy with a well-timed board clear. They went on to win the match, but more than that, they dragged out their last moves to gloat. They even sent me a friend request after the game to call me a fool for playing as aggressively as I did. But here's the thing, even though I lost that game, playing aggressively was the right choice for that deck. If I played conservatively, I was guaranteed to lose the late game. Playing aggressively left me vulnerable to board clears, but it still offered the best chance of success. If you watch a lot of esports, you may have heard commentators throw around the term results-based analysis, which points to this exact issue of trying to evaluate a specific move in isolation. If a League of Legends team for instance takes a risk and it pays off, they tend to be praised, but if another team takes a similar risk and it backfires, they are likely to be criticized for what is essentially the same decision. These games have so many moving parts that, even at the highest level of play, professional coaches, analysts and players sometimes struggle to identify what they are doing wrong, or to go beyond conventional wisdom and established tactics. 
In more casual settings, this complexity is part of the reason why many players, when faced with the lack of guidance or clear instructions in these games, fill that void with assumptions and misplaced confidence. I'm sure you've met this type of player, the kind who knows exactly how the game is supposed to be played and is happy to tell everybody what they are doing wrong, what character they should be playing, who always shifts the blame to somebody else. And while these behaviors may, in part, be human nature, they are also a response to the design of these games. I'm not saying that toxicity would end if only games did a better job of telling players what they are doing right and what they are doing wrong. Hell, even if games flashed the words, this was your fault, whenever you mess up, it wouldn't stop players from lashing out and blaming others. Still, with a problem as massive as the epidemic of abuse in online games, it would be negligent not to consider every possible contributing factor. Too often, our discussion of toxicity in multiplayer games is limited to how we can fight its effects, by restricting social interactions or muting offensive players. We rarely talk about the underlying causes of these behaviors, perhaps because that would take us into some uncomfortable territory. A frank discussion of the relationship between design and player behavior might force us to admit that, to a certain extent, our goal of creating sophisticated competitive games and our goal of creating positive and peaceful social interaction are at odds with each other. In trying to make sure that games are competitively balanced and feel good to play, designers may inadvertently be compromising the, for lack of a better word, friendliness of their titles. Just think back to what we said about Yogg-Saron at the beginning of this video. By giving the card special visual and musical effects that make it satisfying to play, Blizzard are at the same time exaggerating the card's effectiveness, and thus leaning into the frustrating effects it has on your opponent. In the absence of clear guidance, small design choices such as this can contribute to superstitions held by players, which in turn inform their interactions within the game's community. I wish I could offer you a nice conclusion to tie all of this together, but this is a messy problem with no simple or obvious solution. Games with as many players and as many moving parts as Hearthstone inevitably take on a life of their own, and there are limits to how much instruction their creators can reasonably offer, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't hold them accountable. And before we can start to do that, we need to acknowledge game design as one possible source of toxic behavior. As much as I love these massively complex games, the equally massive amounts of hostility and toxicity in their communities suggest failings of not just individual players, but their design on the whole. The sooner we are ready to admit that, the sooner we will be ready to do better.